good evening and welcome. Tonight we are going to be going over the history and geography of Madagascar. As you can see here, Madagascar is an island. It is the fourth largest island in the world. Here's my pencil hiding behind this book. After we go over the history, we'll flip through this book and look at the amazing pictures of the landscape here in Madagascar. But yes, Madagascar is an island off the coast of Southeast Africa. You can see the Mozambique Channel here. And over here, it's the Indian Ocean. Madagascar is the fourth largest island in the world. And it has four very distinct regions, so let's go through each one. We're going to start off on the east coast here. You can see there's lots of mountains right here. So the east coast has a big sloping off area down to the coast. You can see all these rivers coming down from the mountains. This area is full of wet, wet rainforest. Um, very thick forest, very wet and rainy. It rains pretty much every single day. I mean, it does rain every single day, but pretty much all day, every day. And as you can see, this coastline is incredibly straight. And Mother Nature does not make lines this long and this straight, doesn't she? So it looks like this because when the French were in control of Madagascar, which we'll get into, they constructed a long canal here along the coast to connect all of these different rivers together so that you could travel along here and visit different parts of the island. Pretty clever, I think. Um, also along the coast we see the city here of Toa Messina, the second largest city in Madagascar. Real quick, the language of Madagascar is one of those very complex ones, if you saw my last video yesterday. Um, incredibly beautiful, incredibly interesting, but very complicated. Not one that I can master after um, how long have I been working on it? Like five or six days. So I'm using the American English pronunciation for everything. So I believe in Malagasy, which is the American pronunciation of the language. I think it's Malagash in Malagasy. It's complicated. This would be Tuamasi. Anyway, it's complicated and I decided to just use the American English pronunciation for like this entire video so that I didn't have to put in a lot of extra work and I realized I was flip-flopping a lot between um, the Malagasy pronunciation and the English American pronunciation so we're just going to stick with the American English pronunciation. So with that out of the way, let's move up to the north here. You can see right here it's labeled in French, Massif du Saratanana. So this would be the Saratanana Massif, right? Saratanana, sorry. I'm still working on pronunciation. Um, a very mountainous, mountainous area. The highest peak is right over here. Oop. Right there. It would be Maramukotro, the highest point in Madagascar, and um, apparently it's very, very difficult to climb because it's surrounded by like lots of rocky, jagged peaks and forest and everything that apparently it's more difficult to get to the mountain than to climb the mountain. Um, but yeah, there's lots of little mountain chains running all along down here. Um, and there's some really interesting um, rice fields, kind of like what you saw in my video on the Philippines, how they built the rice fields into the hills. Lots of that. And in the little valleys, there's lots of rice paddies. And it's just a, a beautiful little landscape. Um, in this area, we have the capital city of Antananarivo. And... Um, we also have the largest lake. This is Lake Alautra. And let's move on to the west coast. So as you can see, Mother Nature designed this coast. Very, very jagged, which means that there's lots of little um, bays and 
which means there's lots of little ports. So it's mainly used for that. The Mahajanga you see right here is a big port city. Um, lots of port cities all along here. And this is a good time to point out their island. So this island right here is called Nosi Bay in American English. Um, this is the big tourism island. As you can see, there's an airport there. Massive, massive tourism um, industry on this island. The other important island would be this one. Um, it's labeled here in its French name, Nosi Sainte Marie. Its name in Madagascar is Nosi Braha, or Nosh Barah, I think, in Malagasy. And um, it's also a really beautiful um, little tourism island. And um, the islands and the coastline over here were pirate havens back in the day, but I'm getting ahead of myself. We'll talk a little bit about that when we get into the history. The coastline over here is marked with a lot of mangrove, kind of swampy terrain. And um, we have some interesting points. Um, there is, they're not labeled on here, I'm really bummed, but there's a really cool national park that there's a lot of really cool pictures of in this book, in the book I'll show you tomorrow. It's located right about here or so, and it's called Singi de Bemaraha, at least in American English. <laughs> you can see in Bemaraha Plateau, it says there. Um, Singi in Malagasy means the place where you cannot walk barefoot. It's a very, it's, it's an amazing language. It's very poetic. Um, lots of very incredibly jagged rocks all throughout the park. It's a sight. It doesn't look real. And speaking of not looking real, it would be right about here, I believe, yeah, near Mondava is the Avenue of the Baobabs. And there are these freakishly gigantic baobab trees, like just these absolute um, unreal baobab trees. I think it's the very first picture in this book. Let me show you real quick. It's like my favorite trees in the world. Yep, look at this. What the heck is that? <laughs> This doesn't look real. It's so insane. Baobab trees are nuts on its own, but um, yeah, Madagascar is just a place with a lot of giant trees and giant things in general. It's a weird place. Um, moving on to the south here, where the, the climate and terrain is completely different. It's very deserty, very dry, very rocky. Um, lots of really beautiful rock formations, but it's not like desert desert. There's still a lot of life here. Um, right here you can see Salo National Park. This is where um, you find a lot of the ring-tailed lemurs. So um, lemurs in Madagascar go hand in hand. Um, lemurs are, you know, just like part of the identity of Madagascar. I think there's over 60 species of lemurs on Madagascar. And it's believed that the lemurs floated over on logs from Africa over to Madagascar. And at the time, they didn't have any real predators. So they just took off and thrived and multiplied and evolved into all different kinds of lemurs of shapes and sizes. There's the mouse lemur that can fit in the palm of your hand. There was a species of giant lemurs that were the size of gorillas. They're extinct now, almost thankfully. There's lemurs that walk on two legs, four legs. Like, there's there's every kind of lemur, every, like, natural color, every, my goodness. And I talked about in my National Geographic video about the I.I., where um, they have, like, a really long, spindly middle finger, and they're really tiny. They're, like literally like the size of your hand and they're just really creepy looking and yeah just the evolution just had a great time on Madagascar but um that's mainly because Madagascar was one of the last places in the world to be inhabited by humans um along with Iceland and New Zealand um Madagascar wasn't inhabited by humans until about the year um 
well, it would have been in the common era CE, sometime between the year 350 and 550, um, people from the Malay archipelago came over to Madagascar and settled. Uh, the Malay archipelago being over in Southeast Asia. So it was not first settled by Africans, it was first settled by Southeast Asians. Sometime between the 7th and 9th centuries, um, Arab traders arrived and of course began trading with them. They also brought Islam, of course. Every good Arab trader brings Islam to a new region, along with um, all of their cultural advancements like um, their writing. This was the first time that the Malagasy language was written down. Um, they brought, you know, their sciences, um, you know, culture, all those things to the island. And then in the year 1000 or so, a wave of Bantu migrants came to the island from Africa. I, I really can't wait to do a video about the Bantu migration because I've pretty much mentioned it in any African video that's like south of like the equator because um, it's just like one of the probably I think in my opinion the most interesting migration of peoples but I'm not gonna get distracted <laughs> with history but uh, a wave of Bantu settlers came to the island and mingled with the people here and created the um, Malagasy culture that we know today. And then around the 11th century, the Tamil merchants came being from India and they brought the Zebu, which is to this day like the most important cattle in Madagascar. It's an incredibly, incredibly important animal to the culture. like how we associate camels with the Sahara, like the Zebu is to Madagascar. Like they are so important to the culture and agriculture and everything. So the Europeans don't cite Madagascar until the year 1500 when Portuguese explorer Diogo Dias is blown off course. So he's sailing around Africa and he spots the island and um, Portuguese, um, little trading posts were set up along here. Um, they traded with the people on the island and um, eventually the French got involved in the 17th century. And it's during this era where the pirates got involved. The islands and the coastline up here, all these little islands were little pirate havens and I actually just got a really cool book about pirates that has like a whole chapter on the pirates of Madagascar. So we'll get into it someday. Hello, rooster. <laughs> um, Rooster is excited about the Pirates of Madagascar, but um, it's a really, really fascinating history. But um, if I get into it, it'll be the whole video. So just know that pirates really took off in the area. Um, what was also going on all throughout Madagascar was the many, many, my goodness, so many different cultures of people were on this island. And, um, again, if I got into it, it would be a five hour video. So I'm only going to mention the most prominent one, which was the Marina, but all throughout Madagascar were different cultural groups and, um, some of them like rose and fell from prominence, but the, um, Imarina kingdom was centered in here. They had their palace in Antananarivo. And they are slowly um, gaining dominance over the island. And um, the king that brought it the most under control was King Radama I. In 1817, he signed a treaty with the British governor of Mauritius, um, basically saying that Britain would recognize the kingdom of Madagascar and um, defend them if need be in exchange for slaves, um, which I guess both people benefited from. So both people, both countries benefited from. And um, a wave of British missionaries came to Madagascar to preach Christianity um, in like a huge way. Like there was a huge wave of missionaries that came here. Um, but that came to a screeching halt 
when um, Queen Rana Valuna I came to the throne in 1828. And she was a very interesting character. The, the, the Marina Rule family is what I want to get into in this video. So um, she was the wife of King Radama I. And he had appointed, I think, his nephew to be the heir, but it was like in secret. Like he didn't want people to know. He was like training him in secret to be the next king. So when he passed, his like circle of advisors had kept his death secret um, to like prepare an announcement. So the queen <laughs> basically announced before they could like, oh, he actually named me the queen and then proceeded to murder anyone who could dispute her and anyone else who could claim the throne. So she became queen. And, um, she was, like, basically the Bloody Mary of Madagascar, to put it bluntly. She killed a lot of people. <laughs> she, well, anyway, with Christianity, she made it illegal. And it was basically like, get out or you will be dead. So she, she kicked out all the Europeans out of Madagascar. Um, all the Christians out of Madagascar. And it was basically, um, only an equal um, standard with witchcraft, which was also made illegal by her. And she implemented this, um, like a witchcraft trial measure where um, you would eat this poisonous tree bark. And if you vomited it up, then you were safe and you know, you weren't lying. But then if you died from it, then you know, you were obviously lying. But um, you would have like a servant test it beforehand to make sure that the poison worked so no matter what like someone was going to die from this trial and um it's estimated around 3,000 people were killed annually from these trials and she reigned for 33 years so it's by the end of her reign it she had killed off 20 percent of the population <laughs> it's a big yikes honestly um, she also really implemented a policy of forced labor as taxation. So instead of paying taxes, you worked off your taxes, um, which also, you know, wore out a lot of people. You know, not everyone can work like that. So it was a lot. So when her son became king, King Radom II, in 1861, he tried to quickly, like, reverse Uno card all of her policies. He permitted religious freedom. He reopened the country to everyone. He asked people like, please come back to Madagascar, especially the Christian missionaries. He was like, please, please come back. The French really hopped on that opportunity and came back in a big way. And the political sphere of Madagascar was not happy about that. Um, and they actually overthrew, well, they assassinated him and <laughs> overthrew him in doing so um, because of his ties to the French and because they were worried of an absolute monarchy taking control, which after Queen Rana Valona I, I kind of get it, um, but it's actually rumored that he wasn't killed during the assassination attempt and that he was just rendered unconscious by accident. And as they were like carrying him out in his little like tomb grave, he woke up and the people carrying it freaked out and dropped it and ran and he escaped and that he just lived out the rest of his life in hiding in like a, a town somewhere, pretending to be like a normal person and died of old age. So we'll never know. It'll be like a, a history mystery. So uh, that, that's also fascinating to me. But anyway, um, the, the um, prime minister overthrew the king and he had an idea. He went to the queen, um, King Radama II's wife, and said, I have an idea. Instead of just abolishing the monarchy, why don't we get married? And I'll be like the political ruler and you'll be like the figurehead, like the face of the monarchy. And she was like, I guess... He just killed my husband, but I guess. And she turned to his brother, who, um, I'm, I'm not naming names because I really don't want to butcher them because, wow, Malagasy names are a mouthful. 
um, but I've been practicing this one. His brother was named Rani Laya Rivoni. Rani Laya Rivoni. There we go. You see what I mean? It's That name's easier than the first prime minister. <laughs> uh, so she turned to him and said, let's just overthrow him and we can get married and you can be prime minister. So they did. Um, and this guy, Rani Laya Rivoni, um, not only married this queen, but married the next queen and the queen after, <laughs> which is a choice, but I mean, it became like the, the new tradition of the royal family is that you marry the prime minister and you rule jointly. Um, but yeah, I don't know. That's weird to me. Really weird, especially because, um, Queen Rana Valuna the third, like grew up uh, like Queen Rana Valuna the second was her aunt. And so she was kind of like raised by her. So she had like the prime minister around her as like a child and apparently he like when she got married young like in her early 20s and he apparently murdered her husband the the prime minister Rani Laya Ravoni murdered her husband so that he could marry her when she anyway I could get into it what a fascinating royal family but sadly they came to a swift end um in 1883 France invaded Madagascar it's it's a complicated explanation, but um, the very first king, well, not the very first king, but the first king to rise to prominence, King Radama the first, signed an agreement with this French guy in the north who wanted to own like a huge plantation and like basically like take over like an entire city. So he had worked out like an agreement with the king that he would pay like ten percent and be able to control like this huge section of the northern coast and then he cried foul and said oh you know that this queen's kind of nuts and is ruining everything and the french kind of ran with it and used that as like a basis to invade over time and um they they did invade and started a war and then just once they won they kept invading and eventually marched on the capital and annexed the island in 1896 and made it a colony the next year and they abolished the monarchy and exiled the whole royal family to Algeria and took over the island and implemented all the bells and whistles of a French colony. Like the French language was implemented, French um, building roads, infrastructure, all of that. Um, you know, just implementing um, schooling also was implemented. Um, you know, teaching French in schools, building more schools, building more churches, building more, um, everything, uh, mainly plantations, of course, to make it profitable, but you know what I mean. Um, jumping a little bit ahead to a little more in the 20th century, Madagascar did see some battles in World War II in 1942. Of course, by then the French had been taken over by Nazi Germany. So the British headed down here and um, fought the Battle of Madagascar, mainly so that the Japanese couldn't invade and take over this island, which apparently they were very close to doing by then. So they prevented that from happening. So by 1945, at the end of the war, the Malagasy people were really fed up with all of the, the occupation stuff going on, and they started an independence movement. And in 1947, it got very violent. Um, France eventually agreed to negotiate independence as long as it was peaceful because it got very violent, to put it kindly. Um, so they did manage a peaceful transition to independence and they were granted independence on June 26th, 1960. Now the road to an independent Madagascar gets a little rocky after that. Um... And again, I'm leaving out the names of some of these politicians just so I don't butcher their names. Um, but anyway, the first president um, was deemed too um, politically aligned with France. And he was very popular at first because he was like, you know, the first president and all, but um, became increasingly unpopular throughout his tenure as president. And after many protests against him, he stepped down. There was an interim president whose approval ratings were so low that he stepped down. 
The third president was assassinated after six days in office. The fourth was overthrown in a coup after I want to say like four months in office. And he was replaced. <laughs> I told you it was a rocky road. He was replaced by a man named Didier Ratsuraka, who implemented a Marxist socialist government from 1975 to 1993. And as you can imagine, it was, um, I mean, it was a socialist government in the 1970s, so it, it wasn't the best time to run that kind of government, and um, Madagascar was hit very, very hard economically. Uh, there was a big economic crash on the island. They went completely bankrupt by 1979. Um, there were huge protests against them all throughout the 80s, and in 1991, the Presidential Guard fired on the protesters, and that was really the last straw. A transitional government was set up, they made a new constitution that created a democracy, multi-party system, all, all of those wonderful things. They elected a president named Albert Zafi, um, but he was eventually deemed incredibly corrupt and was impeached a couple years after he was elected. And um, they held, you know, they, they had an interim president until the next election. So when they held their next election, they uh, voted in Ratsiraka again because his campaign promise was that he would do a lot better this time and that he would be democratic and just be really good. And you know what? He, he, he was better. <laughs> At least he didn't implement a socialist government again and destroy the government and the economy even more than he had. I can say that for him. Um, but in 2001, they had an election situation that was very similar to the American election in 2000, where there was a big dispute over who had actually won. And um, unlike the American one, which lasted, what was it, like a month and a half, two months, this went on for seven months. And eventually, um, his, um, opponent, the person running against him, um, Mark Ravalomanana was elected president. I got that one, yes. <laughs> um, but, um, he slowly became unpopular as well when the, um, opposition party was, um, op opposing him and, um, they were getting more and more oppositional and he was like guys you got to stop being so oppositional and to put it bluntly I, this is a big summation of this event um I, basically it was like oh you think that's oppositional i can be even more oppositional and he was like oh well i can stop you i'm the president and he would do things like shut down their tv station and just try to silence them which you know, I, I, I get when someone is so against your policies that they're doing everything they can to keep you from passing legislation, but the answer is not to try to completely silence them, you know? But anyway, that's, that's my opinion. But in 2009, it became a, a bad, a bad time. There was like a huge political shakeup that really came to a head out of all this. I mean, it resulted in the death of about 170 people. It led to the president um, fleeing into exile and a special election being set up. And um, some people say that it's technically a coup how it was because they basically forced the president to do all this. But I mean, it's debatable. It's a, it's a very clever way to run a coup, a very risky way, but it worked, I suppose. And thankfully, since then, the elections have gone, you know, much fairer and much better than they have. You know, it's not the best political situation, but by far better than anything they've had before. So it's hopefully on the up and up. The, the biggest issues in Madagascar currently are um, just the, um, the wealth of the nation. It's an incredibly poor nation. It's never recovered from its economic failures in the 1970s. They've been mainly relying on tourism, which of course in 2020, that was a bust. Um, their health sector has always been not the best. Um, 
you know, 2020 wasn't their first massive outbreak of an infectious disease. They've had um, bubonic plague um, outbreaks and malaria outbreaks. And, um, you know, it's um, public health is an issue. Oh, it has been for quite a while. So there's that. Um, it's just, um, yeah, poverty is a huge issue in Madagascar. So um, from... What I've seen in my research, it's slowly going up, but not at a very fast rate, but up it's certainly going. It may not rise to any kind of prominence anytime soon, but maybe someday in the future it will. I really hope so, because like you're going to see in here, this is an absolutely stunning place. So, so, so beautiful. Let's check it out in the book. Madagascar. The name Madagascar. So, the name um, comes from Marco Polo, the explorer. So, he was writing out a map of Africa, and he um, confused it with Mogadishu, which is a big mistake, because <laughs> Madagascar is nowhere near Mogadishu. And then he misspelled Mogadishu, and it looked like Madagascar. And apparently, there was no agreed-upon name among all the different cultures and groups of the island on what to call it, so they just went with what the Europeans were calling it off of their maps. So that's how we get Madagascar. This fishing. I think that's an interesting way to get a name for a country. Look how gorgeous. So, so beautiful. beautiful blue water. We've got a political map. We've got the market here. This is the Sini de Bemaraha. Look at these rocks. Definitely a place you can't walk barefoot. And it's neat to see um, the videos of the lemurs here. There's um, Shifak lemurs, and they, they walk on two feet most of the time, and they jump across these rocks. It's really weird to watch. There might be a picture of a Shifak lemur in here. Physical map. And this is... A river in northeast Madagascar. It says, look at these clouds up here. So pretty. Here is the rainforest area I was telling you about. Very, very thick. Very forested. And you can almost like feel the humidity. I mean, it's that part of the world like this is the Tropic of Capricorn right here. That part of the world. And it's the part of the world where they get hit with cyclones pretty frequently. So flooding is always an issue. Look at this. This is in the Central Highlands. So like I showed you all those little mountainy ranges. That's what it looks like. Isn't that gorgeous? This, this is what it looks like on top of Maromakotro. What's this guy doing? Anyway. Um, here's a rice field. So neat. We've got some cities here. This one is Ansarabe. And this one is Vianaransa. Vianaransa. Nope, I still butchered it. Vianaransoa. Which is nothing like how it's actually pronounced there, but we're moving on. The mangrove swamps along the west coast. And this is what the south looks like. I told you completely different from the rest of Madagascar. It's still very beautiful. Some of the very thorny plant life in the south. And um, an example of slash and burn. So, um, even like the very first settlers did slash and burn, um, what's it called, like clearing? So, um, it's still an issue today, but the government has really been cracking down on it, and they've been making all different kinds of nature reserves and reforestation areas to try to um, fix all the damage. Another picture of the Sini de Bemaraha. <laughs> Look at this guy. Ooh. Lemurs are the weirdest looking creatures. And this is a Fusa. I've never heard of these animals before researching Madagascar. They are a type of mongoose, but they look like cats and they act like dogs the weirdest little animals. Apparently there used to be giant fusas back in the day when there's megafauna on the island and I can't imagine. <laughs> Yikes. Oh yeah, here's a shifak lemur. They're so weird. And there's of course the ring-tailed lemur. 
This is a giant jumping rat. So many bizarre animals. We've got a tomato frog. As you can tell it has its name. We've got, oh, these um, chameleons with those tongues that like, like go like that. One of the extinct creatures that lived on the island, an elephant bird, which was massive. I think they're like twice the size of ostriches. The eggs weigh 20 pounds, like they're big old birds. Locusts being an issue sometimes. Some more baobab trees. They're so unreal. What a landscape. That's so gorgeous. This guy, personality of the century, he was a scientist who pushed a lot of environmental issues. Darwin's orchid. And look at this starfish. It doesn't even look real. <laughs> this is off of the coral reef, and this looks fake. It doesn't look like a real starfish. A drawing of the um, Malay people sailing across the Indian Ocean. Oh, and there's a diagram of it. The, these people went there. There's a stamp with um, Diego Diogo Diaz on it, the first European to see Madagascar. This is a king from one of the tribes I didn't talk about. He's from the Sakalav tribe. Um, We'll get into that another day, most likely. I'm sure we will, but not today, at least. So this was the first great Marina King, and I practiced his name, and I didn't feel like writing in my notes, so I didn't mention him in the history, but he is important to the Marina line. He was the father of King Radama I. Um, so I think I've got his name. So check out, this is a good example of what Malagasy names look like. So he was King Andranam Poin Marina. I think that's how you say it. I could be very wrong, but I'm pretty sure. Anyway, if anyone knows, feel free to correct me. This is a good map of, of the Marina Kingdom expanded. So this is what it looked like in 1810. By 1840, it was all of the yellow area that you see there. So, on Ile Sainte Marie, we, there's a pirate graveyard. It's very, very cool. This is some European missionaries. A marina fort that was built. And this is Prime Minister, this is what I'm working with, Rani Laya Rivoni and his third wife, Queen Rana Valuna III, the last monarch of Madagascar whose husband he apparently, yeah, whose husband he apparently murdered, allegedly. The Queen's Palace in Antananarivo, which um, had a devastating fire and ruined most of it. It's really sad. The Royal Hill, which was the um, burial grounds of the old Marina Kings, and it's like a sacred place. Some rebels from the uprising in 1947. And this is Charles de Gaulle shaking hands with the first president, Philibert Sirenana. And this is Didier Ratsuraka, who was the um, president for more than 20 years. This would be Albert Zafi, who was the first democratically elected president after the new constitution was implemented. This is one of the... Um, Politicians who fought for, who fought for, who um, worked for independence, Giselle Rabe Shahala. And this is from the 2009 political upset. This is a line of people ready to vote, it says. That's good. The flag, let's read about the flag. It says, the color red has great meaning for the people of Madagascar country sometimes referred to as the Red Island because of the color of much of its soil. In the 17th century, the Sakalava people called their land Manabe, which means Great Red. When the Marina people came into power, they added white to the red for their country's colors. When Madagascar moved toward independence in the mid-20th century, it wanted a new flag. It kept the red and white colors from earlier times and added green. 
colors stand for purity, sovereignty, and hope. This flag was formally adopted on October 14th, 1958. And there it is being waved. We've got, so this was the president at the time this book came out. And he had the longest name of any world leader, which this was his name. It says down here how to pronounce it in Malagasy. But you know what? We can save it for another day. A meeting of the United Nations in Madagascar. A court building. A picture of Antana Narivo, the map of the city center and a military parade. Farming in the rice field. But that feels good between your toes. I wonder how cold it is. So the currency, um, I've heard like three or four different ways of how to pronounce it, so I'm just not even gonna bother. <laughs> it's spelled like this. So there you go. Cutting some sugar cane and bananas and vanilla so half of the world's vanilla comes from madagascar so when you eat vanilla ice cream it most likely came from madagascar here's a zebu this is what they look like they have these big humps on their back and these big horns and they're incredibly incredibly important to the people like if you own a Zebu, that's basically like the most valuable thing that you own. This guy's a brick maker, making bricks. A resources map. So, um, there is an oil industry trying to pop up, but there's environmental concerns since, like I said, the whole trying to um, replant all the trees and there's so many areas to protect so many wildlife regions to protect that oil might damage the island but could save it economically it's a double-edged sword there like this guy is demonstrating or showing off this chameleon and there's the chameleon <laughs> so like that's what environmentalists in madagascar are trying to protect little lives like that Little lives like this. They found a crab. <laughs> Look at it. <laughs> Very proud. <laughs> we found a crab. Population map. And it's a lot of people in one canoe. Let's see. Oh, these are Comorans. Awesome. Busy street. An ethnic group map. So there's so many different peoples that live on Madagascar. An example of um, Malagasy mixed with French. Working hard at school. Beautiful face paint. Look at that. Gorgeous. Receiving communion. There's a tradition of having like very eccentric graves in some cultures also um oops sorry you can see here um you put your zebu horns on your grave like you sacrifice your zebu once you die and your horns go or their horns go on your grave to kind of show that you are wealthy and they have this tradition um some cultures do where you um dig up your loved ones after a few years and replace their burial shroud and you throw a party for them like you hire musicians and you know talk to them and just tell them how things have been and then rebury them so it's it's neat but um yeah it's like you have a little you a party for them and they it's it's like weekend of bernie's basically but much more solemn and traditional this is how the Betsileo people bury their dead in these cool little rock mound tombs. It says this is a festival for religious freedom. This guy is apparently attempting divination. That's pretty neat. And the caption here says twins are 
bad luck, which doesn't seem very fair. Just, you can't control being born a twin. There's a Thurman. Santa's here. <laughs> here he comes. Little cars made out of recycled cans. That's awesome. Got this lady working on a loom. Weaving some beautiful fabric. And some beautiful dyed cloth. It's a very famous poet from Madagascar, Jean Joseph, Jean Joseph Rabea Rivello. This instrument, which I've also heard pronounced a few different ways, I won't try, but it's the national instrument of Madagascar. Playing some soccer. A big sports stadium in Antananarivo. And this form of, it looks like mixed martial arts, doesn't it? Moriangi fighting. Mancala, the best game. This game is so much fun. <laughs> it's so great. And they have this other version. This is like the national game of Madagascar, which it's like a chess or checkers game where you have to move your pieces to capture other people's. It looks really fun. Look at this guy next to the baobabs. Baobabs, that's right, that's one of our tangle words, isn't it? Baobab, 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 baobab. Anyway. There's always pictures of weddings show the, 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 what they look like in each country. This is the tradition they have. Um, I guess kabar is how you'd say it in Malagasy. Um, but it's like, um, like a storytelling speech kind of thing. Very interesting. I'll probably talk about it in our book tomorrow. I think so, yeah. Doctor doing a checkup. And this is a lamba, which is a piece of cloth. And there's like a million different ways to wear it. Oh, how sweet. Look at this baby. <laughs> look at those cheeks. So sweet. Oh, look who's getting a haircut. Awesome. And we're making some rice, it says. Yum, yum. And there's some stew, some tomatoes, looks like, and some rice, of course. And we're eating dinner, and she's wearing a beautiful dress to dinner. <laughs> looks awesome. Coconut chicken, yum yum. So this street food, it's a tree trunk, but then it's like flavored and it tastes sweet like candy or something. I've been reading about it and I'm, I'm not sure how you're supposed to eat it but apparently it's like really 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 good but I'm confused by it uh, something I need to look more into and some rural homes where you can see they've elevated it to spare it from flooding we've got some I was talking about how um, electricity isn't provided across the entire island it's kind of an issue each culture has their own form of hat making, and wearing a hat is a sign of prominence. And we've got some very excited kids waving hi to the camera. Very excited. And that's the end of our book, so that means it's the end of our video. <laughs> Little lemurs. So, thank you so much for watching. I hope you found this video relaxing. I know when I get excited about a country, I, I kind of lose my ASMR voice, so I hope you found this video relaxing. And I do hope you found it educational, and above all, I hope that you have a very good, 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 good,